you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2024 Waterfront Alliance Conference. I'm Kathy Robb. I'm honored to be the new chair of the Waterfront Alliance Board. And I'm also the founder and principal of Robb Water Partners. Water in adequate quantity and quality is the key environmental challenge of our time. I'm thrilled to be here today, our 17th gathering. Because of this gathering and your dedication to a better water future, we have made so much progress that I am so proud to be a part of. But the water challenges that remain are of mind-numbing complexity. We and many other talented, dedicated people like us long ago solved the easy problems. What remains to be resolved going forward is going to demand that we do hard things and together. One of the great strengths of the Waterfront Alliance is our ability to convene, bringing diverse perspectives to the table while advocating for what the Waterfront Alliance believes to be the most important for our region. This conference is known for its thought leadership and cutting edge discussions among all of you about the future, a future defined by water in a region defined by water. We can only solve the complex problems we face together and through critical thinking across disciplines and coordinated action across sectors. So, among us nearly 700 people in the room today, we have environmental justice nonprofits and community leaders, the offshore wind community, and leaders from across our port, <clears throat> educators and students like our waterfront scholars, and students from the New York City Harbor School, representatives of the government agencies and real estate company who provide their vision and the capital to make big projects happen, <clears throat> lawyers like me who believe that the rule of law is critical to building our water future, and landscape architects, civil engineers, urban designers, and builders whose sketches bring ideas to reality. If we learn nothing else from our pandemic experience, we learn that there's really no substitute for the magic of bringing all of us together. We do resilience better than any species on the planet, and our interconnectedness is the best of us. And so the theme of our conference this year is designing for tomorrow the multi-sector approach to resilience, because multidisciplinary solutions form the bedrock of planning and building for a resilient future and guarantee the community equity and justice we all crave. One sector represented here today is a group of 92 students from 36 public and private colleges tomorrow's leaders in the maritime industry and environmental sector, selected by application to receive a scholarship to the conference. I'd like to ask them to stand so we can recognize them. I hope you will seek them out and learn more about their pursuits today and how we can best support them. Many members of the remarkable board of directors of the Waterfront Alliance, which helped make it possible, are here. I ask that they stand and be recognized. Please seek them out throughout the day and share your ideas. I want especially to thank our Vice Chair, Captain John Boulay of Dewberry, who made it possible to offer engineering professional development hours credits for several of today's sessions. If we had endless time, I would preview for you the terrific speakers we are going to engage with today 
and point out that three of the most cutting edge resilience projects in the country are only a few hundred yards away from our home here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Battery Park City, which we love. But as the poets always remind us, time flies and we must move on. To speak a little more to what brings us here today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Courtney Worrell, our wonderful president and CEO of the Waterfront Alliance. Thanks so much for joining us today. Courtney. All right, thank you, Kathy. All right, I want to also, similar to Kathy, I want to express my gratitude to the work that all of you do. Your lives as professionals, volunteers, donors, or citizens, the choice for a better future, a more resilient future, a future that can give us hope and a sense of possibility as we face climate change, one of the greatest challenges humanity has faced. Our partners and sponsors are in it with us and with all of you, and we want to thank them for making this event possible. First, New York Cruise Lines. Last night was amazing. Thank you for the boat. We presented the first Dr. Edward Williams Waterfront Champion Award to the exceptional organizations, Regional Ready Rockaway, South Bronx Unite, and Rob Markuski, environmental science teacher at the New York Harbor School. Our Commodore sponsors, thank you, Red Hook Terminals and Battery Park City Authority and Waterfront Alliance member Mike Stamatis deserves great recognition for their overwhelming support of the Waterfront Alliance and for what each of you is doing to combat climate change. To our captain level sponsors, AECOM, Arcadis, Attentive Energy One, Dewberry, Equinor, New York City Economic Development Corporation, Stantec and Vineyard Offshore, thank you for all that you do. Check out the sponsors and the materials they've supplied in the digital tote bag and you'll have a chance to connect with them through the day. It's been a great pleasure, pleasure to, over the year, establish the Waterfront Corporate Council. Thank you all for being in the Corporate Council this morning at the breakfast. I want to recognize Atlantic Shores Offshore Wind, Community Offshore Wind, the Durst Organization, Vineyard Offshore, CAC Industries, Hornblower Group, AECOM, Con Edison, Dewberry, Red Hook Terminals, and Scape Landscape Architecture for their dedication and commitments to sustainability and climate resilience. I want to reinforce, as I do each year, that this conference takes sustainability seriously. We have minimized paper. Please find the program and everything you need to know on the conference app or mobile site. Signs and more are printed on recyclable materials or reused from last year and we are not using plastic name badges. My huge pet peeve, don't use them folks. All right, um, so you can return your badge and lanyards at the end of the day and we will reuse or recycle. Catering is fully vegetarian and you won't find individual plastic water bottles or juice bottles anywhere and the closing reception this afternoon, straws and napkins only upon request. I want to make a request to all of our partner organizations, corporations, businesses, and nonprofits here today. Please make a commitment as the Waterfront Alliance has done to host more sustainable events. It's not that hard. The extra costs are relatively affordable and if more of us commit, the cost will go down. With few, yeah. <laughs> no more plastic, no more plastic at climate events, folks, or any sustainability events. With few of us traveling here, very few traveling by plane, the carbon footprint for this event is very small, but we walk the talk with the good practice of offsetting the conf conference with a donation to Green Wave, an ocean regenerative farming NGO, putting back what we've taken out through our travel, energy use, and materials. The staff and the board of the Waterfront Alliance are very proud that we are a signatory to the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, which I encourage all of our Alliance partners and everyone in the audience today to sign. And lastly, for our professionals, CEUs from, so this is the housekeeping part of my speech. <laughs> uh, CEUs from AIA and ASLA are available for all sessions. And PDHs, as we mentioned, thanks to Dewberry, are available for select sessions. So look for the sign-up sheets by the name tag table and make sure to sign in for every session you attended. Uh, one last uh, announcement, a schedule change. Measuring climate resilience will now be held at 11 and Resilience Hub at two o'clock. So those two have switched. 
So look for that or ask any staff member if you have any questions. Okay, so with that, I am thrilled to announce our conference's keynote speaker, Jessica Granis, a senior advisor at the NOAA, at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Her focus is on implementing NOAA's Inflation Reduction Act programs, and she has an illustrious career at the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the National Audubon Society, and the Georgetown Climate Center at Georgetown University Law Center. We are so honored to have her with us. So welcome, Jessica. Thank you all for having me here today. Um, I, it's a pleasure to be in New York City. My dad was raised in Staten Island, and even though he raised me across the coast in, in California, I feel like New York is in my blood. And I know, I have strong respect for the amazing leadership that this region um, has shown on these important issues of resilience. So I'm really excited to be here with you today. I also know what this region has brought um, after Hurricane Sandy. I had the privilege of working with many experts in this room who, along with the Obama administration, championed a new way of thinking about re rebuilding and recovering from natural disasters, using resilience as a central focusing factor and incorporating innovative solutions like nature-based solutions into the way that you were recovering and rebuilding after the storm. And lessons from the work that you led after Hurricane Sandy are deeply informing what we're doing in the federal government as we make historic investments through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act, which we affectionately call Bill and IRA, or Bill and IRA, and I'm gonna. <laughs> um, the key difference is that while New York and New Jersey and Connecticut had to experience, it, experience the devastating impacts in order to get the resources they need to build resilience. With Bill and IRA funding, we have this unique opportunity for the first time to get ahead of the boom. We have this opportunity to help communities make investments that will significantly reduce or avoid those risks before the disasters strike. And as this image makes clear, and as you all know, this work is more important than ever. Last year, we broke the worst kind of record with $28 billion disaster events. More frequent intense flooding, heat waves, wildfires, and droughts are increasingly damaging homes and businesses and sadly even claiming lives across the US. That's why we at NOAA are leaning in on this huge opportunity we have by, with the $6 billion in funding we received through Bill and IRA. Three main priorities are driving how we at NOAA are deploying these historic resources. First is building a climate ready nation. We know that providing the critical climate data, services and resources that practitioners need to understand, prepare for and implement solutions to reduce their risks are critical to the work that you all are doing. Second is supporting work to advance the environmental stewardship of our ocean and coastal resources while also ensuring that we're supporting the important economic development that these resources generate, which we call our new blue economy. And last but not least is centering equity in everything we do. We know at NOAA that climate change is a risk magnifier. It wor worsens longstanding inequities experienced by frontline and overburdened communities. And through recent equity statements and equity roundtables, we're listening. We're ensuring that our funding opportunities are prioritizing investments that will meet the needs of those communities and groups that are being hit first and worst by the impacts of climate change. Bill and IRA has been a game changer. It has supercharged our ability to invest in our nation's infrastructure, resilience, and our competitiveness. So what are we doing with these historic resources? We're investing more than $4 billion in building climate-ready coasts. This includes supporting resilience planning and capacity building in state and local governments and tribal communities and territories. It includes restoring habitats and implementing nature-based solutions that are gonna reduce risk to communities. It includes training the climate-ready workforce to make sure that we all have the skills and resources and expertise needed to take on this incredible challenge and catalyzing private sector investments in climate resilience. 
We're also investing more than a billion dollars to improve our ability to provide the critical climate, weather, data, services, tools, and resources that practitioners need to build a climate-ready nation. More than a billion dollars is being dedicated to support efforts to rebuild sustainable fisheries, to promote environmental stewardship, and ensure that our fisheries are climate ready and they have healthy habitats to sustain themselves. Finally, another half billion dollars is going to NOAA assets and infrastructure that supports communities across the country, and $40 million is going to ensure that we have the ability and capacity to quickly permit the projects that are important to your community, so helping you implement those nature-based solutions and those offshore wind projects that are so critical um, to solving this crisis. So what do these investments look like in the ground? In the first two years, NOAA has awarded more than a billion dollars to support nearly 200 projects around the country that rebuild and restore coastal habitats and support resilience in communities. Some of the examples pictured here, so I'm gonna go clockwise um, from the top left. Uh, in the top left is Rye, New Hampshire, where we're supporting an investment to upsize key tidal cul culverts, which will um, improve fish passage enhance salt marsh habitat and reduce flooding and erosion in communities while protecting roads, properties, and businesses. We're removing dams in places like Massachusetts and Connecticut to increase ha access to a healthy habitat for fish while also reducing downstream flood risk for communities. We're restoring urban stream corridors in places like Jacksonville, Florida to restore healthy riparian habitats, improve water quality, reduce flooding, and create recreational amenities in underserved areas. We're restoring critical riparian habitat in areas like Pescadero, California to restore historic salmon runs in places where salmon was thought to be extinct, while also providing year-round water access to farmers redu and reducing flood risk in a community that was devastated by historic storms last year. And then finally, we also have projects here in the region, including efforts to restore protective oyster reefs in places like the Great Bay Estuary in New Jersey, to restore salt marsh habitat in Jamaica Bay, and to restore healthy dune habitat in places like New Jersey and the Rockaways. But across all of these projects, we're seeing that partnerships are key to being successful. So that's why it's so exciting to be in this room, to see so many different people working on resilience across so many different sectors and disciplines. All of these projects involve state and local officials working with federal partners, tribes, nonprofits, transportation agencies, universities, and others bringing different disciplines to the mix. And just like this room, we know it takes a village to build resilience, so thank you for what you do. But these are just a few examples of our Bill and IRA investments. Across all of our projects, the location, the project type, the communities may differ, but the takeaways are always the same. These dollars are saving lives and livelihoods, they're revitalizing communities, they're protecting people and habitat for generations to come. Similarly, on the Climate Ready Nation front, we're working on many important products and services that practitioners need to help them better understand their risk, make informed decisions, and take proactive measures to adapt. This includes providing and updating tools like our Coastal Mapping and Assessment of Risk, or camera tool, our Sea Level Rise Viewer, and Coastal Flood Explo Exposure Mapper. These tools help communities assess their vulnerability to coastal flooding and develop strategies to protect infrastructure, manage development, and plan emergency response. NOAA is also investing to update our precipitation frequency atlases that developers of critical infrastructure use to plan and design infrastructure to account for changing precipitation patterns. And with our new Atlas 15 product, we will for the first time incorporate future climate projections in this tool so you can design infrastructure assets to know um, how those precipitation patterns are gonna change in your region. We also recently announced an $85 million industry proving grounds initiative, which is designed to co-produce climate data and services with key sectors and partners from the private sector, including finance, reinsurance, architecture, and engineering industries. So it's exciting to see so many of those groups represented at this conference. By co-developing 
data and services, we hope to close industry identified gaps and provide the critical information that these key sectors need to adapt in their businesses and better serve their clients. Then finally, we're working to ensure that we're integrating equity into delivering the tools and resources needed to meet the needs of all communities. We recently released our Equitable Climate Service Action Plan, which lays out a plan for addressing longstanding and system disparities in access to resources. Um, so that's also a huge priority for NOAA. But we're not done yet. So up next for our IRA programs, um, later this summer we're, we'll, we will be announcing another billion dollars in awards, 575 million in awards through our Climate Resilience Regional Challenge Program, which was a competition designed to support transformational regional scale um, approaches to building climate resilience like this region showed us how to do after Hurricane Sandy. Another $50 million will be announced shortly through our Climate Ready Workforce Program. These awards will support efforts to train and place workers in good jobs in climate resilience fields because we know that we need that expertise in the workforce. And last, later this year, we'll be announcing $55 million in funding to support ocean-based climate resilience accelerators, which are designed to start up new businesses and catalyze private sector investment to develop new and innovative products and services to support coastal resilience work around the country. We also, through our first year of bipartisan infrastructure law programs, saw $3.3 billion in unmet need through our first round of programs. So we're using half a billion dollars in IRA funding to supplement those bill programs that I'm gonna talk about right now. So with 555 million, um, that will be combined with bill funding to support high quality projects that we wouldn't otherwise be able to support with bill funding alone. So at the top here are a list of bipartisan infrastructure law uh, programs. These were laid out in the statute as to what NOAA was to support with that approximately $3 billion in funding. Um, and starting at the top, the National Coastal Resilience Fund is a partnership that NOAA administers with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. They're currently in the midst of their 2024 competition and will expect to announce awards in October. And this program will have another round of funding that will be opened in 2025 in February of next year. Um, with our coastal zone management and natu national estuarine research reserve programs, we recently announced $123 million in funding um, in Maine in April on Earth Day. Um, and there will be another round of uh, that competition coming later in 2024. Uh, and then over the coming months and over this summer, we will announce awards through our marine debris programs, transformational habitat, tribal and underserved, and hopefully our fish passage announcement will be out later this week. But we're not down. We have another round of co funding coming uh, with no funding opportunities being released later in 2024 and early 2025. So get your projects ready, start building those partnerships, send us your good ideas, we wanna fund you. Oops. So I wanna conclude by providing some ways to learn more about these programs and to urge you to continue to engage with NOAA partners and others about the important work that you all are leading in this region. As you all know, investing in adaptation is just that. It's an investment. Every dollar we spend today will hopefully save us six to twelve dollars in losses avoided in the future, not to mention the, the suffering that is caused when we're not investing in resilience. We saw extremely high demand through our NOAA program. Some programs saw up to 28 times more demand than we had in available funding in our programs. And while Bill and IRA are huge new money, we all have big visions and we have all have big goals and we know this problem is very challenging to deal with and so this can't be once in a lifetime funding. Um, it will take all of your work and expertise, 
So help us figure out how to do this work. We've started at NOAA new and innovative partnerships with private sector, with faith-based organizations, with community-based organizations. Help us identify more. Who's doing important work in your communities? Who should we be talking to? We have NOAA staff and offices, labs, reserves, and sanctuaries all over the country. Let us be a partner in the work that you're leading. And your stories are key. Help us, help us champion this work by showing how this funding is needed and what you're doing with these important resources to reduce risk in your communities to, so that we have the funding we need to protect what matters most. So today I'm really grateful to be here with you and to hear your experiences and your ideas and your stories, but I can hope that you continue to share your stories with others and to tell the important benefits that these investments are making in your communities so that we can make the case that we need more funding to continue to ensure that communities and states have the resources they need to support the resilience work in communities. So thank you all for inviting Noah to be part of the conversation and I look forward to the rest of the conference. Thanks so much. So I think we're going to do Q and A. Is, okay. Any questions from the audience that I can? Oh, <laughs> that helps. Okay. I got it. Thank you, Jessica. It's great to um, have you in the room, and uh, I can personally speak from experience. It's been wonderful working with Noah particularly for marine debris removal, um, both post-Sandy and presently. Shout out to Katie Morgan, your regional director here in the Mid-Atlantic region. She's been wonderful. So we're really focusing our sites on some of the opportunities, putting the partnerships together, putting together work sites. I think the, <clears throat> I think the, one of the big, I'll call it the elephant in the room perhaps, is you talk about future grant opportunities. We're looking at current ones right now. How much do you see the election that we're coming up on in November, for those who haven't heard about it, um, <laughs> impacting some of the uh, desire to push out the bill, the IRA, uh, as, the, as the year proceeds past the election? It's critical. Um, we, rescission is a real and live concern for all of the federal agencies, so we are working very hard to make sure that we're getting this money out to really good projects so we can support the work that you all are doing on the ground. Uh, rescission is live. IRA funding, you know, is, is not time bound, so we're working to get the bulk of those resources out this year. The bill funding will come over the next, continue to be apportioned over the next two years, so we, we're, we're working to get those um, obligated in grants as well, but we will have additional funding opportunities, but yes, uh, the election will be critical to making sure that we have uh, resources to continue this work and uh, to, to, to ensuring that we can spend the resources that were appropriated through through these laws. What are the chances for increased funding for national marine sanctuaries? I know there's a bit of an effort going on, but I'm just curious if any of this fits on these particular uh, bills. Yeah, some of the resources are being used to explore the creation and designation of new uh, marine sanctuaries, including in Lake Erie. Um, so there are resources going to sanctuaries designations in uh, the Pacific Remote Islands as well as the Chumash uh, Sanctuary. So yes, that is part of NOAA's priorities. And um, I have not been fund following the, the, the budget uh, appropriation cycle in terms of the sanctuary's funding for, for the next fiscal year, um, but that is a big priority for NOAA. Jessica. Okay, if I could have our panelists come up. We're going to be starting the program with a panel. So, <clears throat> Jessica, thank you so much. 
Um, <clears throat> we're going to be to come on up and take a seat, our panelists, for the next panel. We're turning to our panel, Building for, for Regional Resilience, the Need for Regional Collaboration. Uh, our panelists today are Sonia Brubreaker, the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Miami, Dr. Stephen Hammer, the CEO of the New York Climate Exchange, Susanna Randall, the Chief Resilience Officer for New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and I'll be moderating. So, I believe my mic is supposed to go on. Yeah, there it did. Right. Good. It <laughs> Wonderful. It's magical. I know. <laughs> it's great. All right. So, this panel is about resilience and collaboration. And one of the reasons why it's, it's so important to talk about climate resilience and the reason Waterfront Alliance is so dedicated to it as a topic is that we, we know that funding for climate mitigation, for reducing greenhouse gas, <clears throat> gas emissions, for decarbonization is there. It isn't enough, but it far outpaces the funding and the resources available for climate resilience. And so with that context, it's important to also note that resilience and adaptation is often more complicated. It's all complicated, but the complications really fall among you know, many of the reasons why we're here, the interdisciplinary solutions, what's needed to work across boundaries. So the theme of this panel is collaboration, and each of you is working in one way across a boundary. So I'm going to start, and um, you will introduce yourselves quickly as, as you answer the question. So for Susanna and Sonia, we're going to have you both describe uh, what you do as chief resilience officers what your role is, and how your role might differ, differ from other types of resiliency officer positions, and then how do you foster collaboration in your roles? So go on. All right, all right, I will go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, I am Sonia Brubaker. I am the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Miami, and I also serve as the Director of our Office of Resilience and Sustainability. And, um, and this position is, um, is pretty new. Within the past like six, seven years, um, I was in the DC for about 20 years, um, uh, most recently at the US Environmental Protection Agency. And I saw that this work was, uh, was getting started and you know, I wanted to be there on the ground, on the local level, getting the work done. So, um, so I, moved, I moved to Miami about uh, two years ago. Um, and in this position, I really spearhead um, and share resilience expertise kind of across the city. Um, I work on both adaptation and mitigation. Um, so I'm a chief resilience officer, and you know, some cities have chief sustainability officers. Um, I do both, <laughs> um, and you know, I also look at, um, you know, it's kind of like centered on, on climate change, but I also look at other stressors um, caused by um, housing affordability um, and social equity issues um, for collaboration, and really that's the only way to get this done kind of within a city. I, I work with over 17 um, city departments in implementing resilience actions into, um, into really city processes. Because um, really, like my office, you know, resilience and sustainability, you know, really is, is the one who kind of uh, brings forward the initiatives, really starts them, um, and then hands them to the departments. And because that's where the manpower is, the longevity, <coughs> and the budgets. And so, you know, we really have to make sure that, that this work kind of, you know, to be able to be operationalized um, is really in, in the city budgets. Um, and we have over 140 actions that we are tracking on a quarterly basis through three different uh, resilience strategies. And so it's, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of work and, um, and, and really working together. Um, and really the key, I think, to, to, to it being successful and, and having the collaboration work is to, is, was to have all of those departments and everybody at the table as we were developing our strategies. Because oftentimes, you know, we're like, oh, we're gonna develop a strategy, and then it's just kind of like, these are all the aspirational things that we wanna do, and then, you know, sometimes plans sit on the shelf. And for this work, you know, that can't happen. There, there's a sense of urgency for our work that, you know, things really have to happen um, 
as soon as possible. And so to have everybody kind of on board and to say, hey, these are the things that you're already doing, and you know, these are the things that we need to kind of expand and explore um, and really kind of strengthen and, and, and know how to speak the language that, that, you know, that, that they're dealing with every day um, is super important. And, and kind of to sustain that, um, I hold monthly resilience action group meetings like in our city where all the departments come and kind of we share kind of our progress um, on these actions. And you know, so, so that's the collaboration I think within the city. Also, I collaborate with our county. So there's a chief resilience officer for the county that I am in. Um, our state, the state of Florida, also has a chief resilience officer. Um, and then even now, I think across, um, across states, um, just kind of meeting Susanna um, in, in kind of you know, learning about um, kind of uh, Susanna's history and kind of her knowledge of Miami. I think that you know we're even <laughs> going to be collaborating um, across states. So um, so very. I, I, this is just such a small world, and um, we all need to we all need to be in it together. So we should share the inside <laughs> secret there. I was born and raised in Miami, and so as a yeah. you know native Miami girl, we were chatting and the preparing for this uh, this panel. And uh, we were talking about the Miami River, uh, yeah. which is, uh, I had a very inspirational teacher in high school who was determined to find the spot in Biscayne Bay where fresh water bubbled up out of the bay as a spring where early uh, mariners would come and refill their fresh water supplies. But when they removed the rapids and the falls in the Miami River and lowered the river six and a half feet, that bubbling spring no longer ran. So, you know, the inspirational tidbits that, that I think, and for those of you who are still studying, take full advantage of the great professors and uh, teachers that you have because they are just a gem of inspiration as we, you know, move forward and connection. You know, that's really yeah. the theme is, yeah. is collaboration and connection, right, today. Absolutely. So my name is Susanna Randall. Uh, I'm the Chief Resiliency Officer for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, I'm the first ever Chief Resiliency Officer for DEC, um, and I've been there less than a year. Uh, before I joined DEC, uh, I know we talked about Sandy and Irene and Lee weren't mentioned, but all these many non unnamed and named storms that we have been building back from um, and recovering from, I had the pleasure of uh, working for the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery before joining DEC. And prior to that, I, uh, really my career was focused on green stormwater infrastructure and natural systems. So to give you a little bit of a, a background of kind of how I landed where I am, because I think that's important to think about pathways and connections, uh, particularly for folks who are still in school and trying to figure out, hey, I might want to do that job someday. How do I get there? How does one become a chief resilience or resiliency or whatever the title might be, uh, however it's formulated type role in an organization? whether it be at the city level, at the state level, at the county level, a nonprofit, uh, in, in whatever sphere. Um, I have a little bit of a unique uh, resilience, maybe it's not unique. Uh, in my role, I wear a few hats. Uh, maybe the primary hat uh, at the moment is that of the Bondak Czar. Um, and I can't really see you all very well, but I'm gonna just ask, how many folks are familiar with the New York State Environmental Bond Act? 2022. Okay, a fair yeah, number. A Good, hands. excellent. All right, because there's some rooms where there are not so many hands. So just briefly, for those who aren't, um, New York State voters overwhelmingly passed in November of 2022 the Clean Water, Clean Air, Green Jobs Environmental Bond Act, and this was to support 4.2 billion dollars being invested in four different categories of funding, and so. Part of why I mention this so strongly in terms of being my role as Chief Resiliency Officer is I have the luxury in some ways of being the de facto chair of the subcommittees moving those funds out. So we're looking at how do we sustainably invest in resilience projects, in resilience for communities, and how do we do so not with single purpose funding? And that's a really key thing because when I look at New York State, we're here in New York City, we're on one waterfront, but we also have the North Shore all the way up north along the St. Lawrence Seaway. 
uh, which is many working ports. We have Erie, we have Ontario, we have Lake Champlain, we have the canal system, which is historically a uh, really important waterfront, more now as a recreational waterfront, but still really an integral part of New York State's economy uh, and history. Um, and for those who aren't aware of the, the Hudson, when we look at that, we're really talking up to Troy in terms of the tidal reaches of the, of the river. And so one of the things that I want to leave you with when we think about waterfronts uh, and we think about collaboration and connection is region in terms of watersheds, right? Everything drains somewhere. And if I look at the major drainage basins for the state of New York, the Hudson is only one. We also drain into the Chesapeake Bay. We drain into the Mississippi. We drain into the Great Lakes and the Seaway and ultimately out to the Atlantic. So to really think about it, when we look at how do I impact the, the coastline, what's coming downstream, not just what's coming at us from the ocean, what's coming at us in terms of sea level rise, all of these things interplay. There's so many different types of, for example, flooding that we have to uh, look at, whether it be groundwater, coastal, coming up through inlets, coming up over the shore, coming up in Miami, sorry up through the limestone, um, through the ground, you know, groundwater, but maybe it's saltwater intrusion more. Um, so many challenges. I know I kind of, kind of went around, but it, resilience, I think, also, it's really about that connectedness, and we'll talk more about this, I think, as we, as we go on. Great, all right, thank you. So Steve, as a collaborative model for climate change, it's the New York Climate Exchange, which is new and amazing, and tell us about your plans, what you're doing to foster collaboration, what you hope the future will be for you. So take it away. Great, well, thanks very much, Courtney. Appreciate the opportunity to, to join you. Um, I will say anybody who can um, work to bring over 80 students to a conference like this, well done. That's <laughs> yeah. really well, I, I wanna thank, I should thank New York City Economic Development Corporation for subsidizing and helping us with that. So th that is great. Th yes, um, so thank you so much. That's huge. So uh, again, show of hands, anybody heard of the New York Climate Exchange? A few of you. Um, Governor's Island, if you walk down to the Battery, so just you know, quarter mile from here, and then you look and there's an island close by. The Statue of Liberty is over here. Governor's Island is right in front of you. Several years ago, the city, as part of its strategy to develop an island that has been under city control for the better part of 20 years after the, the military and the Coast Guard moved out, um, settled on the idea that climate was going to be a recurring theme. And I think there are folks from the, the Harbor School who are here, there are several nonprofit organizations or educational institutions who are already on the island beginning to give it climate as a recurring theme. And the goal for the exchange, working in partnership with the trust for Governor's Island, which is really the parent of the entire strategy, the goal is to create educational opportunities for undergraduate and graduate students to establish research facilities looking at climate, not just in the New York Harbor area, but, but globally, to establish some activities related to climate tech incubation, and then a very large training and convening function. And so um, come back in four years and I'll have a beautiful campus, but in the time being, we're really just getting things moving. I've been on the job for about six months. I was at the uh, the World Bank as a senior climate policy advisor for the last 11 years. Um, and the exchange, the, the notion of the exchange, and the Waterfront Alliance is one of our important community partners, and, and we are a coalition. 12 universities, and they range from schools here in New York, and that's Pace and Pratt and CUNY, Stony Brook University, which really pulled the entire consortium together, Georgia Tech, Duke, University of Washington, Rochester Institute of Technology, Oxford University, very wide ranging set of academic partners. Then I've got corporate partners, IBM, Moody's, Boston Consulting Group. And then I've got 33 community level partners, as I said, the Harbor School, the Waterfront Alliance, labor unions, cultural institutions, the Museum of Natural History here in the city, the Climate Museum here in the city, We've got workforce groups. We've got environmental justice groups. We are, you know, in our DNA, this notion of collaboration is fundamental. And, you know, what we're trying to figure out now, and I'm, I'm very much in growth mode, so please go to my website. I have eight jobs that I need to fill. 
Um, <laughs> I've, I've hired four people in the last three weeks, and I'm going to make two more offers this week. So very much in growth mode. We have a lot of work to do. And, and partly it is finding the appropriate government partners. It is bringing the tremendous research capacity that I have access to, to the table, getting that corporate perspective, getting the community perspective. The, the fundamental notion underlying the entire proposal that was submitted to the city was you need this full array of voices to get better outcomes. And that's what we're going to focus on. And it's going to be on coastal resilience issues. It's going to be on mitigation issues. Wall Street's essentially in our backyard, so it's going to be on finance issues. There is no issue, given my partner base, that I can't work on without having an extraordinarily rich array of experts available to us. So our goal is to find the programming that best leverages those types of partners. And, and I think the, if I just finish up one key message for me, it's really about value add. Because if you look at what those partners are already doing, include the alliance in that, that's already in play. So the question is, if we were to bring these additional resources to the table to be working in partnership with you, what could we do more of? What could we do faster? And I, I, I put faster on the table as a critical issue or a critical thing for us to think about because if you're paying attention to the science, moving fast is something we are not doing right now. There is a lot going on, but it needs to be done in half the time, in a quarter of the time. And so figuring out how to break through the barriers, figuring out how to get consensus around issues by having those different voices at the table is going to be really critical to how we approach things. Great. All right, Sonia, how would you tell us a little bit about the specifics of what's happening in Florida and Miami in, related to sea level rise, climate impacts, and then what are the strategies that you're implementing and how do they align with some of the larger collaborations such as this, the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact? Yes, so Miami is ground zero for climate change. The sea level is rising. And it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you, you sit on, you know, everybody says it, everybody knows it, it's a fact. Um, it, you know, it, it simply floods more than it used to. Um, and, and, it, and it's actually accelerating. I mean, the projections show two feet of sea level rise by 2060. That is a lot. That is a lot of water, and it's actually, you know, happening even faster. There's a recent article that was looking at tidal gauges um, at, at, at multiple different parts um, of the southern United States, um, and in, for Miami in particular, it showed uh, six inches of sea level rise since 2010, and so that's mm -hmm. even exceeding um, the projections. So, so urgency, <laughs> urgency for sure. Um, you know, and it's, it's not just, you know, a city of Miami issue, you know, it's also a regional issue. And it's something that, you know, that, that the region has been looking at for, for some time. Um, back in, in 2009, uh, four counties in uh, Southeast Florida came together to say, hey, let's collaborate and, and work together on how we're gonna address climate change because in reality, you know, it, it addresses kind of all of us. Um, there are, you know, there are parts kind of within those four counties that are kind of lower level sea rise than others. And so I, people were thinking of, you know, future migration. People were thinking of, you know, how do we prevent displacement? You know, how do we kind of sustain our economies? And so um, they came together on the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Compact, where those four counties kind of come together to make, to make decisions. Um, one, one of the big decisions that, that was made was that, you know, everybody was going to use the same uh, sea level rise uh, forecast uh, from NOAA. And so we're using the intermediate high. And we use that in all of our stormwater master plan updates. We use that um, in it, just any sort of kind of infrastructure projects, you know, that, that we're looking at. Um, we, we use that with our building departments, um, 
when you know we're, we're updating code for how you know tall buildings need to be in the floodplain and, and things like that. Um, and so um, that kind of regional kind of aspect was just you know so important. And and from that, that allowed uh, Miami Dade County to then do a little bit more localized approach, uh, which we call Resilient 305. 305 is our area code. So everything in Miami is something, something 305. <laughs> so, so Resilient 305. And, um, and, and that kind of really, you know, you know, we were able to kind of come together and know that we could work together because that larger effort had happened. Um, and really, we were each, um, the municipalities within Miami-Dade County, as well as the county, were going out for grant funding um, for, for resilience, and, um, and, and nobody was being successful. Um, because really, people don't understand that there are three Miamis. <laughs> there's, there's not just one Miami. There's the county, um, and that's you know when you fly into the airport, you know, you're flying into the county. Um, then there's the city of Miami, where there's all the culture and where you you know have dinner and, and sometimes you stay. And then there's you cross the bridge and then there's Miami Beach and that's what people quintessentially think of, of Miami. But really we're 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 different. Um, we we have all different uh, demographics, uh, challenges, but we all are dealing with climate change and, and we need to solve that. So we came together um, as Resilient 305 and we were able to um, get a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation and the 100 Resilient Cities at that time um, and, um, and really kind of form this partnership. Um, so we were able to do that kind of from that, that larger county kind of regional and so now our county and then from that is how kind of the city of Miami is able to do our work because from the, the Rockefeller grant, um, the chief resilience officer position was created for the city of Miami. And so um, that's how you know, we, can do, we can do our work um, and it's, you know, we, we wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise. There's so much to be said about that. That's a whole other <laughs> panel, so <laughs> I, I would love to explore that. All right, Susanna, tell, bring it back to New York and New Jersey and back talk about York. regional collaboration. If it, where is collaboration um, happening between New York and New Jersey, or Connecticut, it's, it's this, the whole region? Um, uh, if it were present, what would be better? And what could we do, be doing um, more of and more and more quickly if there were collaboration or, or, or maybe it's working great. So, <laughs> so I, you know, so one of the things that I think is a, a strength that we have in New York is we have people working in resilience across the various state agencies, authorities. Um, there's this incredibly large ecosystem of folks really looking to pull in the same direction. Um, you mentioned Connecticut, uh, the Long Island Sound. I saw some folks here um, from Sea Grant who have been really instrumental in that collaboration and that, that relationship, um, working between New York and Connecticut, wor working to advance projects in the Sound. And, and of course, New York, New Jersey, uh, the list can kind of go all the way down the list, and I think uh, you know when we look at the harbor, we look at the harbor estuary, we look at the partnership with the Army Corps to look at alternatives to try and figure out what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what fits, what are the potential unintended consequences of our actions, um, and to try and uh, I think when we have a larger uh, team or collaborative network of folks looking at and engaged in each of these options that gets promulgated from all the various efforts, and I'll talk about those a little bit more in a second. Uh, for example, the Army Corps, it, it allows us to dive deep, but then keeps us looking at the bigger picture. Uh, because it's so important to not lose sight of, um, yes, we have to move fast, but we also have to move in a way so that we don't go down one path and go, oh crud, mm -hmm. we've just caused incredible adverse impacts over here uh, that we didn't intend. Um, and so uh, it's, as we move forward, I'm gonna use an example of, of dams and dam removals, and I was very excited to see the funding in Massachusetts and Connecticut. We would love some more here in New York. I'll just make a shameless plug to you for Noah. Um, one of the things when we look at dams, one of the questions that, that we ask when we're collaborating, looking at programs to roll out for funding, is it reduces flooding for whom? Who does it reduce the risk for? Because it might be reducing risk downstream and it might be reducing risk upstream. Just like a, if we're putting in hard 
hardened structures along the coastline. It's reducing risk for someone, but not for some, another person. So one of the things that, um, that we've really been looking at through all these partnerships and the focus on resilience, and I'm gonna really cast that in resilience as nature-based, nature-focused, how do we restore habitat and ecosystems to be really that, uh, to collaborate with nature for our protection, for our future. And I think that's a really important cornerstone as you know, I think of Miami and the mangroves and how important those are in protecting shorelines and how important as we move forward, we're also gonna need adaptation and mitigation measures. Um, I, think of, I think it was RAM. Um, and so inherent in that, I think um, there is not just a, a regional need for collaboration, but uh, the diversity of collaborators um, in that not just government, not just citizens, not just nonprofit, not just scientists, it's all. It's an and proposition, not an or proposition when I think about how we're going to get there because climate change poses incredibly complex problems or to solve for us. There's not simple solutions to any of the challenges that we face and so we're gonna need everybody um, and so uh, you know, it's really the underpinning of that uh, as we move forward. I think one of the things that we also have a strength and I'm excited as we launch into this year, um, for those who, uh, who watch things like the State of the State or listen to the governor's budget here in New York, you have heard, uh, there's a real focus that we have on resilience. Um, the governor was just in Rome meeting with the Pope, which was amazing. I'm kind of floored by, by seeing that happen and they're really working towards how do we build resilience across the state, working in collaboration with California and Massachusetts on that visit. Um, We've been working for years through things like the Interagency Climate Adaptation and Resiliency Working Group. There are all these different sector-based analyses and studies that we have done, and we're at this point this year, we have the go-ahead and the charge forward to take, a, take stock of all of what we've done and come up with a real action plan based on what we've done, where we are, and how do we propel things forward, not just in one sector, but across all the different sectors, which is a, for those of you who know how big, you know, how big a thing this is, my arms are not big enough, right? You know, it's just, there's so many aspects. So we'll be embarking upon that and, and, and engaging in, in many ways like, like you are in Miami in terms of getting out to the public, hearing from folks, meeting with people and collaborating as we move that, that plan forward. I just want to say the Rise to Resilience Coalition, which we spearhead, we took some credit for the governor's points about resilience. So excellent, <laughs> just excellent. A plug for and, Waterfront Alliance there. I don't <laughs> say there are so many people in this room who probably could stand up and take credit too with you because it really is. It's about collaboration and yeah. partnership to really move the needle forward, and we're all in it together. Yep, exactly. All right. So um, we're going to skip the next question I was going to ask you just in, <laughs> in terms of time, but I want to take it to you. And, and what do you think we really have to get right in the next five years? So I came from the World Bank. And, you know, one of the things, that, and I had been an academic, I had run different organizations, all focused on climate for the last 25, 30 years. And there's a ton of policy, a ton of, good research, a ton of good ideas about what we do more of, and the challenge is this mismatch of when the money shows up, where the money shows up, whose money. <clears throat> if you think about, there's a lot of money available. We saw that during COVID. The climate world essentially looked at that with extraordinary jealousy because they were arguing that we've been saying we need access to these kinds of resources, but you know, it shows up for some other issue. And, and what is it that's actually gonna drive that change? One of the important things that, you know, we're getting into very fundamental considerations of, again, what are individual obligations in terms of paying for remedies when your basement is flooding versus your insurance company? Or if that insurance company bails out on your neighborhood or your state, what are you gonna do? What are the obligations of local government money to help fix the infrastructure. If you've got two feet of water that's coming your way, who's expected to pay for that? Is it local money, state money, a state that no longer allows climate change to be included in, in you know, uh, words on a page, um, or federal money? Um, Wall Street, and there have been some, again, I've been playing in kind of climate diplomacy circles for a long time figuring out how to unlock these vast resources that are available through institutional investors or through retail banks. 
you know, different kinds of deal structures are required. And one of the things that we're going to be thinking very hard about is how do you get those folks to the table, figure out what it is that they need, and how do you structure deals, create new financing instruments via risk guarantees or other type, kinds of things that are, in some cases, readily available, just not employed in this place or in that place. The other big thing that we're going to come back to again and again is if there is this expectation that governments have to keep borrowing to do this. Because at some point, your credit rating is going to go down. At some point, your operating budget is being eaten up entirely through debt service. And in some parts of the world, and I'm talking more developing countries here, you know, the proportion of you know, available state resources to go to pay off massive debt levels that is affecting their ability to invest. That is affecting whether they can make the investments that are going to keep people from going on the mood. You talked about climate and migration. You know, New York City's migration challenge that it's been facing in recent years, you know, an unstated part of that equation is people on the move because of climate change in their home country. We don't talk about that yet. So finding the money to address these things to address it here in the city, to address it at a statewide level, to address it internationally. It's a massive challenge and one thing that we're going to be spending a huge proportion of our time focused on. That's great. All right. So lightning round. I want you each to answer what keeps you up at night, <laughs> but also what gives you hope and makes you feel energized. And if you have any small tips about collaboration, like in terms of coffee networking or something like that. If you want to throw it in there, that would be great. So let's go. Sonia. All right. Um, so I would say uh, hurricanes keep me up at night. <laughs> Partic <laughs> yes. Particularly stronger hurricanes um, fueled by extreme heat. Um, in Miami, uh, we are actually having an extreme heat um, episode right now. We have had four consecutive uh, days of heat advisories, and uh, last year it was it was it was bad. It was it was tough. Um, and last year was the first um, year that the National Weather Service um, for kind of Miami-Dade County uh, did a pilot project to reduce the threshold. Um, of the um, ambient air temperature for um, he both heat advisories and heat warnings. So reduced it from, uh, for heat advisories from 108 degrees Fahrenheit to 105, um, and for warnings from 113 uh, to 110. And we, we did have, we did have um, a couple of heat warnings last year. Mm -hmm. And in Miami, um, you know, the, the temperature doesn't, doesn't get to 100. You know, it gets in the 90s. But when you factor in the humidity, um, that's a whole different ball game, and, and that's what the heat advisory and the heat warnings, that they're more of like the, the feels like temps. Um, and with that, um, the ocean got really hot too, hot too. Um, in Key West, uh, not too far from Miami, um, registered at 100 degrees. Um, and so that was, that was wild. <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of coral bleaching that happened. Um, and, you know, it, uh, it, uh, it, it increases hurricane activity as well. And so the forecast uh, for this year um, are, are lots of hurricanes, um, more activity, and you know, Miami has not been hit by a really strong um, hurricane in some time, and it's all a matter of luck. You know, and so I will keep my fingers crossed and do the great work that we do to try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce sea level rise, to reduce flooding, but also to prepare in the meantime um, through more adaptation projects that are wedge verified. Um, and so <laughs> proud to say that the city of Miami has the first wedge verified um, project that was last year in the state of Florida in our Jose uh, Marti um, Park for our adaptation improvements. And so kind of that gives me hope of, of being able to you know, do, do projects like that while we're um, you know, facing these, these really um, uncertain and very certain challenges. <laughs> Great. Uh, you know, it's funny, I think heat, the prospect of heat keeps me up at night. Um, and it seems maybe ironic since I'm from a hot place. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that I think, particularly in New York, when we look at the projection of the number of days above 90 degrees that we are going to see, that is very troublesome. 
And it's more the nights that are hot that troubles me. Uh, because as we disrupt our sleep patterns, um, it has incredible ramifications for our health. Um, and we're already seeing this around the globe. Um, and you know, the more air conditioners that we put in, the more we exacerbate the issue. And so there's this endless cycle um, of that. Uh, and so that, that keeps me up at night. But I think the thing that gives me hope, um, well, my kids give me hope. They also keep me up at night. But that's a whole nother. Um, <laughs> is it's really hope in, in future generations, but hope comes from also from my colleagues and from connecting with people who are doing good work and who are all focused on making a difference. Um, you know, there's this inc incredible value of, we ha we are, we're really commanded to start to repair the world. We're, we're commanded to start to make a difference. And so I think one of the things about a forum like this is that we meet people who have started the work we may not finish it in our lifetimes. We're not committed to finish it. We have to get moving, and I think get moving fast. So I'll shift to you for your. Um, the keeping me up at night is you, when you're a startup, kind of everything keeps you up at night. <laughs> um, I think the, but it's always tempered by the extraordinary support that I'm seeing locally. I mean, look, the city of New York has given $100 million. I'd like to talk to Bill and Ira about some money, so I'll, I'll, I'll find you afterwards. But the city of New York has been very generous in terms of creating the exchange. Um, philanthropy has also you know, put $150 million on the table to help build our campus. We have far to go still, but you know, that is a great, it's a great way to start. But the thing that I find most extraordinary, and I think it is testament to the fact that there are so many folks doing things locally the interest, if, and it may even be a hunger for something like the exchange that can be a consistent convener of these issues, a steady presence that frankly will weather political transitions, you know, that we can keep the momentum going, keep that conversation going, engaging different communities. The, the level of interest that I'm seeing, it is extraordinary. And I think part of it is because People expect there to be something like that in a place like New York. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you have the UN up the river, when you have Wall Street right across the harbor, when you're a media capital, when you're an arts and culture capital, people are coming here and you have the ability to bring literally the world together in a place and work in partnership with people who are trying to deal with these issues in Jamaica Bay or trying to retrofit power stations in New York City. You can bring all of that together and that is what kind of keeps me going because I know that what we can build is really gonna be able to capitalize on all of that. All right, I would love to keep going, we can't, but I will say there are so many things you all have mentioned that actually will be covered in panels. So I, I cannot resist but say there's something about sharing progress, the ability to share progress. Check, check out the panel on misinformation. It's going to talk about that. But also the measuring climate resilience panel that we have today will also be really important for that. Faster project delivery, we have a panel on that as well. And um, my thanks to uh, colleagues at our friends at Arcadis for working with us on that. So check that one out. Um, also funding, stormwater utilities, uh, that's going to be a, a really important panel today. And then WEDGE, uh, Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines. You've heard it first from someone from Miami, which makes me so happy. <laughs> and there's so much more today on all of this. So with that, I want to thank you all so much for being here today. And thank you all so much. Tyler is, Tyler Taba is coming up to the stage for our next session. Yes, great. All right, good morning. Yes, okay. So 
just to keep us on time, I was gonna summarize my thoughts of that panel, but I think Courtney did a great job, and so I'm just gonna dive right into the last se section of our opening plenary. So hi everybody, my name is Tyler Taba. I'm the Director of Resilience at the Waterfront Alliance. I help lead our policy and advocacy work around climate resilience and adaptation, um, and I also help convene the Rise to Resilience Coalition, which is a wonderful coalition of more than 100 organizations, many of which are here today and on panels and on sessions, so thank you to all of our coalition partners who are here. Um, if, you're, if you haven't seen already, we have a table outside that actually has Waterfront Alliance's 2024 policy platform out there. I would encourage everybody to check that out. And we also have our 2024 Rise to Resilience Coalition policy priorities on that table. And if there's anything that aligns with your work or any interest in partnering with us on any of that work, please come find us. We'd love to work with you. Um, Steve was talking about coalition and we're obviously an alliance and so we really wanna keep that um, conversation about collaboration moving forward. So to segue into the closing session, if you're a real Waterfront Alliance fan or a Rise to Resilience Coalition fan, you know that we have spent the last four years working on passing flood risk disclosure legislation in New York and New Jersey that would require home buyers and renters to be given information about a property's flood risk and flood history that they might not have been able to access before. Um, we had senators and assembly members at the conference last year to speak about this. We've had action alerts, we've had op-eds, we've had blogs. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? This was like the bane of my existence, so if you could like nod your head and acknowledge that, that would be great. <laughs> well, pr so prior to our advocacy, no such laws existed in New Jersey, and in New York there was a $500 credit that you could pay to a prospective buyer at the time of closing and actually opt out of disclosing the flood risk and history of the property. Yeah, crazy, right? Well, I'm really happy and proud to stand here today and tell you that is no longer the case thanks to the advocacy of Waterfront Alliance and the Rise to Resilience Coalition. Yes. Too many people, really, too many people to thank for their collaboration and partnership on this. New Jersey Future, NRDC, Environmental Defense Fund, Center for New York City Neighborhoods, the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice, New Jersey DEP, so many people helped make this happen. Um, and as of this year, you are now, that is now mandatory in both states, signed by Governor Hochul, signed by Governor Murphy. You will now have access to that very, very difficult to find information. <clears throat> so something as simple as disclosing flood risk history, that, was, that took four years to happen in New York. Believe it or not, there was fierce opposition to that. In New Jersey, it happened unanimously, it passed really quickly, so maybe we can just take a second to applaud New Jersey for their great leadership <laughs> on all climate things, yes. Super underrated state. California, New York gets a lot of love, but New Jersey is doing amazing work on resilience and adaptation, so yeah, there you go. Okay. So. We say this all the time at Waterfront Alliance, there's no single solution to the climate crisis. There's also, in that same vein, no single organization that can take this on. And so I thought Steve's comments about working in coalition was so great because we are an alliance of over 1,100 partners. Rise to Resilience is a coalition of more than 100 organizations. And so we are working together to figure this out. We're struggling together, we're succeeding together, and so I hope you'll consider joining us in that effort. So. Now to transition, I want to uh, move into our final segment for the opening plenary. For the next seven or eight minutes or so, I'm gonna turn it over to Doug Parsons, who's the host of the America Adapts podcast. Um, we're really lucky and happy to have Doug at this year's conference. If you have not listened to the podcast, it is a wealth of information and knowledge about all things climate resilience and adaptation. It's like literally the climate resilience and adaptation podcast, so we're really happy to have Doug here. And if you haven't listened, there's so many good sessions on all things that are relevant for the conference today, but also for many things that are probably relevant for your work um, outside of this. Doug is gonna be speaking to Camila Fernandez, who is a graduate student at NYU Wagner Graduate School of Public Service, who was part of an awesome capstone team that worked with Waterfront Alliance to analyze the financial and economic implications of the flood risk disclosure legislation that passed in New York and New Jersey. So her capstone team worked with us over the winter and the spring semester, um, and I'm really excited for you all to hear a little bit more about some of their uh, high-level findings. Lastly, Doug is gonna be working his way around the conference today. He'll be here for the full session and there'll be an episode covering the full conference coming out next month. So if you see Doug around today, make sure to say hello. He'll be with us again at the closing plenary here on the main stage, so be sure to also stick around for that. And with that, I'll pass it over to Doug and Camilla to come up to the stage and thanks again, everyone. All right, this turn on. 
I think it is. Hi, Camille. It's good to see you. Good we just to met see you. five <laughs> minutes before the session. We want to get sit here. make yourself at go. home. <laughs> well, thanks everyone. Thanks to the Waterfront Alliance for inviting me and us having this session. And um, this is the only thing between us and coffee break, but we're, we locked the doors. So, um, and just cut me a little slack. I'm used to being in my pajamas by myself recording a podcast, and here I am in front of this huge crowd and with you. So just uh, cut me some slack. Tyler set the stage on yeah. what this flood disclosure risk, but let's talk about the work that you guys did. Give us a little background, maybe a little bit about your team, but what were you guys doing? What were you trying to accomplish with this? Yeah, so my capstone team, uh, we're with NYU Wagner School of Public Service, and we were, oh, great. <laughs> um, what we were trying to do is assess the economic impact of the flood disclosure law. So looking at cost avoided, and also the financial benefits of this law for both homeowners and renters, and we were looking at New York and New Jersey. Okay, all right, give us more detail though. Yeah. So the, 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 these financial models, and so a lot of times people don't even do that. There's legislation that passed and like, all right, what happens now? This yeah, is yeah. a way of saying, okay, there are real world implications for this financial implications. What'd you yeah, find yeah, out? Yeah. So to assess the financial implications, what our model looked at, uh, we had to create two separate groups. You've got the homeowners who, because they are aware of their risk, they retrofit their home and they have that flood insurance. And then you have your other group of homeowners who, because they're unaware of their risk, do not have flood insurance and do not retrofit their home. So now how do you assess the benefits? What we did is that we compared the return on investment for both groups over 50 years. So what we found is that for a homeowner who undertakes these mitigating efforts, their return on investment is about 10 to 20% more than the homeowner who wouldn't. Now, that is good, but there were some nuances in those findings. In New York, for example, we found that for a homeowner who retrofits their home, that the home equity that they're able to build is 17% greater. That means about 232,000 more in equity that you're able to build. They would also be avoiding cost of flooding of about 13,000 every year. Now, within that, the expenses we did discover that for the first 15 years, a homeowner that undertakes these measures would actually see or experience a hike in their expenses. And the reason for that is because of the financing costs that are needed to take on those retrofits. After the 15 years, we did find that their expenses go down. So there is a benefit for having invested in your home and making it more resilient. So overall, big picture, even if with these fluctuations in expenses, your equity is significantly greater, and so it is a positive return. It's a good thing. In New Jersey, a little bit of a difference in that, at least for the home equity that they're able to build, it is 10% greater. In fact, that equates to about $660,000 more in equity that you're able to build. You also save in flood costs about 7,000 every year, now the issues with the expenses. A homeowner in New Jersey is not only going to experience higher expenses for the first 15 years because of the financing that they have to take out, but even after the 15 years, their expenses are higher than a homeowner who wouldn't undertake this. And the reason for that is because of property taxes. Um, the, tax, <laughs> yeah, the tax rate in New Jersey is almost double what you have in New, New York, and their assessment ratio is actually on the higher end, so any impacts in the valuation of your home will impact the taxes that you pay. And so, big picture though, even if your expenses are increasing or they're higher than your neighbor, uh, because your equity is so much greater, it is still a positive thing. But the thing that is making this model work or worth the investment is the home equity. Now, the nuance is that home equity in and of itself is not tangible cash. It's not something that you see in your bank account. So the question then becomes, if a homeowner is not you know, interested or their priority is not selling the home, or if their priority is not building generational wealth, then is your average homeowner willing and able to finance that additional expenses for the financing cost, and are they able to sustain the higher property taxes. Because again, at the end of the day, home equity is not something that you see in your bank account, but the expenses of property taxes, you will see that impacting your wallet. 
I have all sorts of questions about insurance companies and that, but we don't have time for that. And so I want to, and I'm a Floridian too. I live in Arizona, and I, you brought a lot of Floridians to this event. My goodness. Oh, boy. Um, but talk about the recommendations that come out. You do this research, and then it all opens up all sorts of new questions. And tell mm -hmm. us a bit about that. I think a lot of our recommendations focus on uh, behavior change because at the end of the day, the flood disclosure law, what it is, it's that inform it's information. It's, it's, uh, it's informing you of your risk. But what you want is people to uh, have those, ret take on those retrofits or have that insurance. So, so how do you do that? So for us, uh, I think one key thing is that to encourage homeowners to take on those retrofits, we do need flexible financing, uh, either gap financing or yeah, like flexible financing to actually enable them to take on the retrofits because right now the options that you would have available as a homeowner is a personal loan or a HELOC loan, which comes with a 10 to 15 year term loan with an interest rate of nine to 10% and that's on the lower end. I think right now you would see that on the higher end. So there is that need for flexible financing. The other thing, is, regarding property taxes. So in states like New Jersey, where it could potentially dissuade you from taking on these retrofits, I think it is important for local governments to consider tax abatements or tax incentives to encourage the homeowners to take on those retrofits. And at the end of the day, it is uh, to the benefit of local governments because the alternative of that is completely losing the homes and not collecting any property taxes at all. And I think that does need to be paired with very strong code enforcement. And I think the third thing is that our model not only looked at renter, uh, homeowners, it also looked at the risk the renters have. And I wanna highlight that renters are very vulnerable. I think a lot of people brought it up that there are, when you talk about renters, there's a variable that we need to discuss and that there are significant racial and socioeconomic disparities. And so while there's a lot of research that goes into that or that can talk about these disparities, just to provide an example, during um, the, last, the last hurricane here in New York, uh, Storm Ida, there were 13 victims that passed away during that storm. And 11 of them were actually trapped in unregulated basement apartments in Queens and Brooklyn. And so we do recognize that there's a lot more that needs to be done in the space of environmental justice but one key thing that could protect homeowners is renter's insurance. Now, renter's insurance is not typically purchased. And looking at our model, uh, it would cost, again, this is over 50 years, so the average would be about $800 in a premium for New Yorkers and about 350 for renters in New Jersey. Now, $800, 350 is not an insignificant amount, especially when you're talking about those that are most impacted are renters that are um, economically uh, disadvantaged or that live in economically disadvantaged communities. And so it is important for them to have access to low cost or no cost uh, insurance programs. And that would require the collaboration of local governments and FEMA, for example, either to have those insurance programs be fully publicly funded or leverage private funding, kind of uh, emulating the healthcare system, which is not great, but uh, it does provide some um, <laughs> it, does some, it does provide some variety in, in pricing so that renters could actually afford them. Okay, we're gonna wrap this up here. The last question for you, and Tyler really set the stage. This was a big victory. I mean, I'm from somewhere else, and I, you know, I know it, how hard it is to get legislation mm -hmm. across the finish line, but what's next? What should Waterfront Alliance do? What are you planning to do? Are you gonna stay involved with this, but sort of next steps? What's the next piece of legislation they gotta ramp up and do? So or is that part of this? <laughs> I think uh, there, some things that could, you know, folks in this room can focus on is addressing some of those research gaps. I think one of the key things is um, assessing how resiliency retrofits actually impact the value of your home because currently you can find information on like sustainability retrofits or like solar or passive housing, uh, but not so much on resiliency retrofits. In fact, even at a broader scale in the real estate market, you can find information on how a bathroom retrofit could improve the value of your home more so than a bedroom uh, renovation. And I think that same level of detail is needed for resiliency because that way advocacy groups can be more targeted in saying this is the resiliency retrofit that would yield the highest level of protection and the highest level of return.
And I think the second thing is, and this I think is a more of a limitation, but it will only come with time that it gets resolved, and that is that our housing market hasn't necessarily internalized the full cost of climate risk. Um, and so what that happened, you know, even in New Jersey, those counties that are more exposed to uh, floods, their appreciation rate is almost double the rate of what you see at a national level. So what that leads to is an overvaluation of properties. And that could skew models like this. And so I think, again, it's only with time that we will really start seeing the market internalize those costs. But I think research that uh, focuses on like what that impact would look like and what those costs mean, when exactly would the housing market start to internalize this cost, I think that's super insightful. And um, yeah, I mean, we, this study, we hope that the, with the Waterfront Alliance, as they continue their advocacy, um, this is, these are some things that they can continue to look at. And I work in the affordable housing space, so my bridging point is making sure that the affordable housing that we're building is more you know, conscientious about uh, resiliency in the design of the housing. All right, Camille, thank you for this amazing work that you did thank in your you. team. And so I appreciate it. And thank you so much.